spread the fire, welcome back to SMWX. And if you're new around here, my name is Dr. Sizwe Mpofu Walsh. On this channel, SMWX, the Sizwe Mpofu Walsh experience, we explore South African politics through interviews and analysis. And today I'm really excited to bring you one of our regular and most popular guests, Ukoko Aubrey Machikri. As we come together to dissect, analyze and explore the recent uprisings and unrest across South Africa, the problems of South Africa's public discourse and how it silences the very voices it should be uplifting, and many, many more questions. Hope you enjoy. This interview will be broken into two parts, so make sure you catch both parts. Aye. <laughs> Gogo Obri Machikli, thank you so much for joining us once again on SMWX. Togo za Gogo. Togo za Kelsa. Togo za Fugi. Salam alaikum. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on SMWX, Gogo, and, and uh, sharing your time not just with me, but with our audience. Um, we're very appreciative. And Gogo, I wanted to. Uh, begin um, with a request of yours, which is with with a thought of mine um, and a provocation, um, because we have together thought that these should be more conversations than interviews, as it were. And I'd like to begin with a provocation on South Africa's public discourse. I'm very worried, Gogo, that the space for an alternative imagination, the space for an alternative view of what South Africa could be outside the current status quo, the political status quo, the media status quo, the economic status quo, is shrinking, that we have allowed that space to shrink as citizens, and we have been forced to see South Africa in one way and only one way, and been made to accept the idea that no other way is possible, no other way is imaginable, and therefore we must only accept what we have in front of us. And this has caused a crisis, not just the political crisis, not just the economic crisis or the social crisis, but a crisis of imagination in which we are unable to see a different future at this moment. And so in many ways, the public discourse crisis is linked to the political economic and social crisis. And this is a crisis which is not given the attention it deserves and is a crisis which we need to confront with the same urgency as the other crises. Well, so we, let me start with a reminder that comes from George Orwell. Because to some extent what you are describing is Orwellian manipulation. George Orwell reminds us that just because we live in a democracy does not mean we are not going to be subjected to authoritarianism. Mm. And I think to some extent, that is what is happening in South Africa today when I look at the nature, the content and the character of our public discourse. There, there is an attempt to create a canon of rational opinion. And any view, any thought, any idea that falls outside this canon of rational opinion is deemed irrational. And the manner in which this canon is constructed happens in many ways. The most important for me for the purposes of our discussion today is the fact that it is constructed through English. Mm -hmm. And therefore we who speak English become the custodians of reason and the rationality. Mm. We, we, we fool ourselves into thinking we are custodians of reason and rationality, even as we engage in an assault on reason ourselves. Mm. 
we do another thing, we who speak English. We fool ourselves into thinking that our English voices are representative of the national mood and national sentiment when they actually form a very small part of that. Mm. And then of course, we, we, we have the reality, not only in South Africa, but all over the world, in societies all over the world, that a lot of learning that happens in society, wherever the learning happens, conscious and unconscious, is thoughtless. So to the extent that I've heard many voices in English characterizing the protesters in, in, in words and descriptions which suggest to me that they think of them as those who are barbarians, as those who are mindless. Let us assume for a moment that they are correct in seeing them as such. In, let us assume for, the moment, for a moment that the protesters are mindless. Those of us who speak in English, who relate with the world, who, li who relate with political reality, who relate with economic, cultural, and other realities through English. As I said, we must bear in mind that a lot of the learning we have accumulated was and continues to be thoughtless. And therefore, the mindlessness as imagined by us of those protesters and our thoughtlessness are two sides of the same coin. You know, when you say that, Coco, it, it reminds me of a, of a personal reflection, which is my journey to learning is uh, in, in 2007 mainly, staying as Lalin in Puma Colony and realizing suddenly that I was on the intellectual back foot, that I couldn't uh, articulate myself with the same clarity in Gestosa as I could uh, in Gesi, and realizing the linguistic barriers that exist despite the talents and the brilliance of, of so many South Africans, the linguistic barriers that prevent any entry into any space of privilege just by virtue of the historical accident of, of English being predominant in, in South Africa. And I think you're quite right that we, we often conflate a facility with English in our politicians, by the way, as well, with wisdom, intellect, and some kind of connection to uh, the economic path forward for South Africa. You're right. Um, and our Englishness um, causes damage to us and to others in this way. Um, we, we, we become alienated from those who are not part of our Englishness. And they too become alienated from us, which means we are outside many important conversations that are taking place in this country, that are taking place through languages that are not English. Mm. And therefore, over the past few days, I have seen an attempt to impose a narrative about what is happening through English, a narrative that does not fit pe perfectly with reality, because it is a tiny element of our broader reality as a country and as a mm. society. And I'm reminded of uh, Chimamanda Adichingos, the author, when she talks about the dangers of the single story. And, and why I'm reminded of that is that what we call South Africa is a story. What we call democracy 
is a story. What we call the rule of law is a story. What we call constitutionalism is a story. And these are stories we impose on other South Africans who have their own stories to tell about what South Africa is to them and how they experience democracy, what constitutionalism is to them and how they experience the rule of law. Mm. But of course, to the extent that there has been an attempt to impose a canon of rational opinion, another thing that has happened is an attempt to impose on us a South Africa that is a single story. Mm. Coco, when you say that, it actually opens up the question of how we understand what's happening in South Africa today. We are moving into unprecedented times in terms of a sense of unrest within the democratic setting, which has spread to certainly Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal uh, KwaZulu in, in ways we haven't seen before and, and in, in forms we haven't seen before, ex exactly anyway. And I'm a bit worried about a single story being imposed on what's happening right now, because it seems to me that, well, there are at least three things happening. One is that there, there was certainly a form of sabotage happening, which was linked to former President Zuma's uh, imprisonment in KZN. There is also, I'm even uh, worried about this term looting because of the way it becomes appropriated by certain uh, regressive political agendas. But there has been widespread economic protest, which has in some ways certainly been criminal or at least broken laws. Uh, but I don't think it's been looked at in, in the complexity it needs. Then there are a series of political agendas, political movements, which are capitalizing on the former two uh, to pursue diverse aims. I don't know, it could be hundreds, hundreds of aims. Uh, there are elements of vigilantism. There are legitimate calls for a different kind of economy. Uh, th there is pure desperation. Um, and I have to say, it's not the violence that, that has moved me um, in this moment. But it's some of the images that I've seen of spontaneous acts of desperation to secure the basic means of survival. Um, and I just don't know how you can fail to be moved with all the other complexity and, 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 and that's happening. And then I also have to say, although I've been moved, I've also sent, uh, felt a sense of, of fear because as a South African living in relative comfort, as a South African who has access to the English language, as we've said, one realizes that one is inevitably implicated in the discomfort of others and the desperation of others through one's own comfort in a society as unequal as ours. And so one feels a sense of fear that the status quo is unraveling or could unravel. So all these complex things are happening. And, and when we turn this into there are looters on the streets and we need to send the military in to quell the looters, we lose so much. Mm. Well, so we, we, we drive to exotic spots around the country to save the white rhino and the black rhino. <laughs> and along the way, we are blind to the poverty and the inequality that is crying out for attention. There, there, there is something that is numb about our spirit 
particularly those of us who are privileged. And that numbness finds expression in a blindness, our blindness to poverty, hunger, inequality, and preponderantly realities that have the face of a woman a black woman, we are blinded by that. I know this is no longer fashionable, but I'm going to do it anyway. It is Karl Marx who says, privilege blinds one to reality. So that's one of the dynamics. And you are right. This story of what is happening in South Africa today is a story of many stories. Not all of them make sense because they're so contradictory and they conflict with one another to some extent. And so what do we do? We choose the convenient story and because of our position, we're able to impose it and it becomes the dominant story. When I look at what the media has been doing, it is very clear to me that there we have an example of how thoughtless the learning that takes place in society has become. There is an uncritical regurgitation of popular and dominant thoughts in our engagement with the reality that is in front of us at the moment. And that is why at first, these South Africans were protesters. Then they become looters. Then they become thugs. Then they become mindless Zulus, driven by a narrow and irrational Zulu nationalist impulse. The, the interesting thing about all of this is that such impulses and other problematic impulses are part of the story, but we elevate them in order to impose a particular narrative. And, and the media has been complicit, or let me put it this way, too many in the media have been complicit in the, impos in the imposition and elevation of this narrative over others that coexist with this narrative. Take for instance, how we try to impose a particular conception of the rule of law, a particular conception of um, constitutionalism in order to impose particular ideas about the content of the constitutional court judgment on the basis of which former president Zuma is sitting in jail today. It seems to me in the two, in the, in, in, in the two words or three words, my, my arithmetic ex, uh, escapes me. Four words actually, the rule of law. The emphasis is not on law, the word law. The emphasis is on the word rule. I can use many other words to replace the word rule. For instance, I can call it the imposition of law. And why I would use such a word is because the law is not valueless. And therefore the rule of law itself is not valueless. To some extent, the rule of law is an imposition precisely because it is the product of a dominant way of being, a dominant way of seeing, a dominant worldview. And therefore it is not valueless. It is value laden. And what frightens me, going back to George Owen when he says, just because one lives in a democracy does not mean 
that one will not be subjected to authoritarianism. To some extent, this is a foot in South Africa because alternative views, views that do not coincide with the dominant narrative are being squeezed out mm. of our public space by the judiciary, by judges, first of all, by politicians, by the media, by commentators of different kinds. But that's what is happening. The alternative view is being squeezed out of our public discourse. For instance, how can it be that we cannot see that whatever you think of former President Jacob Zuma, that judgment, the, the, the majority judgment, is decidedly unjust in the relation to Jacob Zuma. Let us imagine for one moment that the penalty for contempt was the death penalty. So this man would be going to the gallows when he had not been subjected to a trial leading up to that sentence. So let's, let's just imagine that the penalty for contempt was capital punishment. One hopes that if those judges are listening to me, they then imagine that their own reasoning would be of a higher quality than what is contained in that judgment when it relates to whether former President Jacob Zuma was treated by them justly or not. I, I take the view that justice must be reserved not for the salt of the earth amongst us, not for the best amongst us. It must be reserved for the worst amongst us. And I'm not saying Jacob Zuma is the worst amongst us. There are worse people in this society than Jacob Zuma. But justice must be reserved for the worst amongst us. And that is how we must judge the quality of justice. They will say, as they say in their judgment, that we gave him a chance to come and make representations. And I will say, you, not him, are the guardians of our rights. And therefore you, not him, are the guardians of his rights. And, the, and in this case, you are not the guardians of his rights. And others will say, Okoko is condoning corruption, is con condoning defiance. Um, and they will connect it to my earlier comments about the public discourse and say he is also condoning violence and criminality. I would say only one thing, I'm not. Beyond that, I'm not prepared to justify myself. People must think what they want to think. But this is one example. Our engagement of the rule of law which shows that dominant narratives have implications because one of the things they can do is to create a climate in which an injustice and injustice in general becomes acceptable in the same way mm. that I look at what we are angry about, what the media, what journalists are angry about. They are angry about the burning of trucks and that is bad, it should not happen. They're not angry about the fact that 50% plus of our population is food insecure. They're not angry about poverty. They're not angry about inequality and the other social and economic injustices that our people face. Those things don't make us angry. Jacob Zuma does, because amongst other reasons, we must focus narrowly on Jacob Zuma, mm. 
because the alternative is to have deep and honest conversations about the state of the nation. You know, when you say that, Gogo, you, you, you bring to mind what I've been fearing as well. And that is that in many ways, it feels to me like South Africa is fighting the last war in the present. And we are numbing ourselves to the present war by soothing ourselves into thinking that we are winning a war that is in the past. So we are blind to the ANC corruption of the present, which in many ways has reached such a form of sophistication that it makes the Zuma tenure look like a bring and bry. We ignore that because the Zuma form of, of corruption, which pertained in the ANC under Zuma's leadership, is now the subject of public scrutiny to the detriment of the public scrutiny of the present war. So in, in waging the, the last war, we think we're winning the current war. And in fact, we, we aren't. And, and this is why I think to be honest, once again, from a personal perspective, I've seen very interesting things that I've never seen before up close because my father's representing President Zuma. Um, so I've seen some of the abuse that comes to me and to him um, for his decision to provide the constitutional right of legal representation, even for someone which he has publicly disagreed with. Um, and I've been quite startled at the amount of abuse, um, not directed to President Zuma, directed to me or to him for choosing to represent him legally, which is a constitutional right. Um, and Lord knows I have criticized former President Zuma. Um, I'm not a fan of his tenure. I'm not a fan of his brand of political leadership. And uh, I've written ad nauseum about my problems with Zuma and the Zuma regime and the Zuma era. But at what cost do we, do we persist with this constant focus on the old war while we leave those who actually hold power today aside from our scrutiny? And, and, and so, I look at a, a president who has somehow now got the, the power to stand up in front of the nation, deliver a one-way address via the state broadcaster, that he's deploying soldiers into the streets, and nobody says a thing. Isn't that too much power for, for a constitutional state founded on accountability? And the reason he can do that is because he tells people that he's winning the old war. And at what cost do we allow the new war to be to distract us from the old war? Mm -hmm.